remind you a very important detail that we're looking at the downfall of Saul in the progression of these chapters. And Saul was actually ordained to conquer Goliath, but he failed. That was his giant. That was his battle. The Lord had anointed him to eliminate the Philistines, and he failed. We see David show up as a, as a kid, and he brings some snacks to the battle, and he leaves with the giant's head in his hand. What a fascinating story how a lot can change in just a, a very short time here. I want to look at a few things here. Look at verse number 4, 1 Samuel 17. Look at verse 4. And there went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. That puts him at about ten foot. Now, if you remember back with Saul, it says that he was head and shoulders taller than the other men. So even a six foot man, that would have put Saul at about seven foot. So Saul is six to seven foot. Goliath is about 10 foot, and here comes little old, I don't know, four or five foot David shows up, and God was able to use him. Uh, look at verse number 8. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. Uh, Goliath comes attacking and he comes provoking and scaring everybody. But notice he assumed that the children of God were the servants of Saul. This was God's people and God's people has God on their side. But when the leader forgets that, then the people forget that. And Saul's error, his downfall, was that he was afraid to conquer this giant. Now, in a sense, Goliath, if we could spiritualize this for a second and say we know about the story and how it begins and how it ends, but how can I apply this to my life? If you found yourself in the flesh staring down a giant with every intention of killing you and having killed hundreds of people already and you essentially were defenseless, there's only one that can deliver you, and that's God, right? So Goliath, in a sense, I want you to think about this, Goliath represents your big problems in life. Right. We've all had problems, and some of us even big problems. And what we have to remember is, where Saul failed was when he ceased to have faith in God that God could deliver against this giant. Goliath, in a picture, if you will, represents our problems. And when our problems come at us, it really shows our true character. It shows us who we really are. It reveals where our glory is at. Is my glory based on me, or is my glory based on the Lord? And is my confidence in my strength, or my smarts, or my looks, or my bank account, or is all of my confidence in the Lord? When your problems come, we have to take it head on. Saul was hiding. Saul was in the midst of slipping and falling and losing his kingdom and losing his family and losing his friends. Saul was making many mistakes. Uh, I want to point something out about Goliath because in a sense he represents the devil but he represents our problems. And when the devil's going to attack you in your life, He's going to come at you in two methods. He's going to attack you verbally and visually. He wants to get you scared so that you won't serve the Lord. If you will, look at verse number 11. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So they hear the threats coming from the enemy, and now they're scared. Does this remind you of early 2019? Oh, no, there's people falling over in the street. You better stay at home. Oh, or just stay home for three weeks and see what happens, right? People were paralyzed by fear, weren't they? And some people overreacted to the point where they quit going to work, they quit their job, they quit paying their house note, right? I mean, that was, that's kind of a, a, a knee-jerk reaction, but this is the power of programming. It's the power of what goes in your ears, when the devil comes to attack you, he's going to try to get in your mind and in your heart through your ears. 
Satan attacks you in these two ways, verbally and visually. Look at verse number 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. Again, the devil wants you to be afraid what you hear and what you see to get in your heart so you stop having faith in God. Right? So the only way to beat your Goliath, this is the, the essence of the sermon tonight, is have faith in God. I know this, well that's real simple, I know Brother Fan, and we do that. No, well not enough, because there's problems that will come to you, and you're going to see or hear something and say, oh no, but this is different, this is too much, this is too big for me, and that's where we have to stop and say, wait a minute, the battle is the Lord's. And if I have faith that the battle is the Lord's and God sent this giant to me for me to slay for God's glory, then we can begin to have confidence in the Lord and give glory to the Lord and have faith in the Lord and fear the Lord instead of fearing the giants. Now Saul had many failures. Flip back to chapter 13. I want to show you a couple things real quick on Saul. Saul had several failures. Chapter 13 Verse 6, it says, When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in the caves and in the thickets of the rocks and in the high places and in the pits. And some of the Hebrews went over to Jordan in the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal. And all the people followed him trembling. So he failed in Gilgal. He was afraid. Uh, this, uh, when they're under attack, he was distressed. They're hiding. They're trembling. Saul began to fail here. And you know what happened? Well, God sent Jonathan in to solve the problem. When Saul doesn't do his job, God would send somebody else. And this is what we have to remember. Whenever a big problem comes, God's going to solve the problem. The question is, are you going to be a David or a Saul? Because if you act like Saul, then God's going to get the glory through someone else. But if you have great faith like a child, you you're not afraid of a giant or 10,000 Philistines. Uh, go to chapter 14. So there in Michmash and Gilgal, Saul fails. In chapter 14, we see something similar in Gibeah. Look at verse number 2. And Saul tarried. That means he was waiting around. Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600. His army of 3,000 by this time was reduced to 600. He's hiding under a tree. He's just like scared, waiting to figure out what to do. Uh, and again, God's going to use Jonathan yet for another victory. Uh, look at verse 24 in chapter 14. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. You know what happens when we think it's our battle and it's our enemy? We hurt other people. If Saul had said, wait a minute, this is God's enemy, and this is God's battle, and it's going to be God's victory, then he would not have cursed the people. Go to chapter 15. So Saul's failures, he failed in Michmash and, and Gibeah. And then we're going to see him fail in, in, uh, with Agag, if you will, look at verse 20. 1 Samuel 15, verse 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Not true. God said, kill him. He didn't. He still had the guy standing there next to him. Verse 21, but the people, now you go, the blame game, it was the people's fault. The people took of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now listen, when Saul was confronted with Goliath, if he had just obeyed, he would have went forward and killed Goliath. Instead, he was motivated by fear. Verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. 
because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. You think about what's happening here. He says, because you were more afraid of the people or the enemy, you essentially set them up like an idol in your heart. When you rebelled against God and you did not obey him, you made an idol. And you know what's happening in chapter 17? He made Goliath like an idol. Oh, I can't defeat this big giant. I'm down here. Instead of seeing how big God was right. over Goliath. Amen. Now, Samuel was sent to finish the work that Saul refused to do. Samuel hewed Agag into pieces, it says, at the end of the chapter. Now go back to chapter 17. So Saul failed multiple times, and God kept sending someone else to finish the work. Chapter 17, look at verse number 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. When Saul feared Goliath, he sinned against the Lord. And listen, I want you to make a connection. The next time you get bad news, the doctor gives you bad news, the bank gives you bad news, whatever it may be, when you have a major problem in your life, I don't want you to react like Saul and say, oh no, what are we going to do? I want you to react like David and go straight to the battle. Right. Don't hesitate. Amen. Don't be afraid. Go to the problem. Fix the problem. Have great faith in a great God that he can kill giants. Yeah. Let's look at this giant. So Saul failed in his leadership. He was called to leadership, but he didn't have enough faith. Now, giants, again, I want you to think big problems in your life. I tell you, I've had major problems in the, you know, and, and I, I've just, it's amazing how the Lord can work and solve things and provide in ways that only could be said, well, that was God. That was His doing. It wasn't mine. It was outside of my ability. It was outside of my scope. I couldn't have seen any way to solve it, but I trusted the Lord would solve it. And He did, and He provided. Uh, we will have problems in life, all through life, and God wants to use them to prove you to strengthen you. Now, he's gonna, it's going to prove you. It's going to prepare you. It will purge you. Sometimes these problems help you get closer to God. I want to look at a couple other giants. If you would go with me to Joshua 13. Go, go to Joshua 13. I want, to, I want to give you a realistic thought about this, about being a giant slayer. Next time you have a giant problem, I want you to have great faith in a great God. Uh, in Joshua 13... Find verse number 12. All the kingdom of Og in Bashan, which reigned in Ashtaroth in Edri, who remained of the remnant of the giants, for these did Moses smite and cast them out. Now wait a minute. Moses is a giant slayer. You know, I mean, we don't often think of Moses as one that killed giants, but here the Bible says he smote them, he killed them, he cast them out, he ran them off. He was clearing the land. Moses was also a giant slayer. Uh, go to 2 Samuel 21 with me. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 21. David's not the only one that killed a giant in the Bible. And you're not the only one that's going to have a problem in life. I want you to have great faith in God. I want you to be encouraged to know that God knows your problems, He hears your prayers. And he wants to kill your giant. In 2 Samuel 21, find verse 22. These four men were born unto the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. You see that? There's four more. There's four other giants that are listed here that David was a slayer of and, of course, by his men. Now go to Job 16. Go to Job 16. Job, in a sense, was also a giant slayer, but you probably don't remember any warfare or any battles in the book of Job. I tell you, the book of Job is such a fascinating study. Job chapter 16. 
I want you to see verse number 14. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. In other words, breaking through, that's what a breach is. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a giant. Now, wait a minute. Now, Job, in chapter 16, verse 14, Job is saying that his enemy is coming on him like a giant. Job is using the word giant as an illustration to the big problem that he had in life. Now, if you know the story of Job, he lost everything. Millions of dollars, all of his servants, all of his family, his health gone like that. Uh, he, he was starting to lose his wife's heart. His friends were being cruel to him and accusing him of sinning before God. And here he says, my enemy is like a big old giant. Now, it, it's interesting. If you go back to verse 1, Job 16, verse 1. Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. Ye all. That's where we get the word y'all from. Okay, so <laughs> y'all is a Bible word. Okay, ye all. But notice he calls his friends miserable comforters. Why? What are they doing? Well, surely, Job, you deserved this. Or you must have sinned against God. Or you probably had this coming. They kept trying to logically come up with a reason why it was Job's fault. We are probably guilty of doing this to other people. Oh, did you hear what happened to so-and-so? Well, they probably had that coming. We have to be careful with this. He's, he called them miserable comforters. Verse 3, shall vain words have an end? Or what emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? He says, what you're saying is empty words and they're hurting, right? Verse 4, I also could speak as ye do. Job said, I could return fire. Like, you have problems because you disobeyed, right? If your soul were in my soul's stead, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. Think about that. Okay, Job is in misery, in ashes, sitting there with his friends, and he literally says, if we traded positions and I was in your shoes and you're in my shoes, I could come up to you and say the same thing to you. Notice what he says in verse 5. But... So he says, but I wouldn't, I shouldn't. But I would strengthen you with my words. And the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. He says, you know what you should be doing as a real friend? You should come up and encourage me and strengthen me and tell me that God is victorious and that God can help me and that I can get out of this and God must have a plan in it even though I'm sitting here in misery. If, if you were a good friend and not a miserable comforter, you would come up and encourage me and you would brush away all my fears and my grief and say, Job, get it together. God is on your side. He will help you. He has a plan in all of this. That's what Job would have done because he was a good friend. His friends, unfortunately, were not doing that with him. His friends were joining his enemy, in a sense, and attacking and blaming and hurting him. Look at verse number 9. He teareth me in his wrath. Who hateth me? He gnasheth upon me with his teeth. Mine enemy sharpeneth his eyes upon me. Now, I remind you that his enemy ultimately was Satan. And Satan used the different bands of armies to come and destroy him. And Satan called fire. I mean, it basically destroyed his family. It was the devil that was attacking. Verse 10, They have gapped upon me with their mouth. They have smitten me upon the cheek reproachfully. They have gathered themselves together against me. God hath delivered me to the ungodly. Notice he's making this point here. It's God that let the hedge of protection go. Only Protection only comes from the Lord. It's not God that's hurting me. It's the enemy, but God's allowing it for whatever reason. God hath delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over into the hands of the wicked. I was at ease. In other words, everything was going fine. I was at ease, but he hath broken me asunder. That's his enemy, the devil. He hath also taken me by my neck and shaken me to pieces and set me up for his mark. His archers compass me round about and cleaveth my reins asunder and doth not spare. He poureth out my gall upon the ground. He breaketh me with breach upon breach. He runneth upon me like a giant. He's calling the devil or his big problems a giant. If you're not going through a problem today, you probably will by the end of the year. I just want to encourage you 
if it's a health problem, if, a, it, if it's a financial problem, if it's a family problem, no problem is too big for God. Amen. It's a giant. Identify it. It's coming from the enemy. Call it what it is. But our hope is in the Lord. And when our faith comes in God, and when we're like, I, I don't know what it is, I don't know what to do, when you find yourself worked up and nervous and scared, not, not knowing what to do, that's when it ought to kick in and say, wait a minute, I know what this is. This is nothing but the enemy trying to attack me and stop me from serving the Lord, and I'm going to confront this giant for what it is. It's just another Goliath, and you know what? God kills Goliaths, so God can use this situation if I'm faithful. Saul didn't kill Goliath. He failed. David did with the faith of a child. Notice he says in verse 19, Also now, behold, my witness is in heaven, and my record is on high. My friends scorn me, but mine eye poureth out tears unto God. He says, my friends can say what they want, but God knows the, God knows the truth. The enemy can say whatever they want about me, but God knows the truth. My record is in heaven. There's a testimony in heaven. Your book is being written. God knows everything, and you, you just pour it out to Him, and you trust Him. Go back, to, go back to 1 Samuel 17, and let's take a glimpse at David and how he handled this giant. Listen, Job's giant was great sorrow and affliction. And... I dare say that none of us have been through anything like Job. Job was pouring out his soul even unto death. He was right up to that edge of being suicidal and saying, why am I even alive? I know we've all been through some bad stuff, but none of us have been where Job is. And Job told us who he was trusting in. And he identified who his giant was. It was the devil attacking. Now listen, we as Christians, there are times that God will allow bad situations in our life so that we can cross paths, we can intersect with people that are not saved. So in our distress, in our mourning, in our pain, in our affliction, we can tell them that there's a God in heaven. He answers prayers. My faith is in Him. And even if it is a sickness unto death, I know where I'm going and I have no fear. My sister works in a nursing home and years ago I asked her, she started, I asked her, you, you, when people die, can you tell a difference who's going to heaven and not? And she said, let me tell you a couple stories. And she did. She told me the stories of the ones where they're just the sweetest person you've ever met, always kind words, Bible, family, good things in their room. And one morning they come in and they're passed. And she told me multiple stories of people in the middle of the night, no, no, no! And she told me it was the scariest thing to eyewitness. When somebody's passing and they're going to hell, I think sometimes maybe there's that crossover. We get a glimpse of they know where they're going. They know. Now listen, I thank God that Salvation is free. It's easy. Jesus did all the hard work. All I had to do was take the gift of God, which is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's His promise and He won't lie. Oh, that's good news. Amen. Well, we're saved by faith, and now in the Bible it says that we need to walk by that same faith. If I trust my soul in the Lord, I trust my entire being, my eternity, in His promise from His Word and His Spirit, then why do I stumble during these little moments in this fleshly life? Why am I weak when something goes wrong? Why am I disturbed when I get a big bill in the mail? Why am I frustrated when somebody gives me a hard time? Why do I let it get to me? Well, that's the flesh. That's the old man that's still present with you. But hey, we have the new man, the, the, the new spiritual. You're born again. Now David, representing the way that a Christian ought to here, I want to first show you David's motivation, and I'll be brief. In verse 24, I want to show you five things that motivated David 
And then we'll finish the story. Verse 24, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the men, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy in Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches. Motivation number one for working and attacking your problems? Money. Money. Now look, we don't live just for money here, but it does tell us in Ecclesiastes that money answereth all things. David, so there's five things that caught David's attention. Money. Okay, if a man won't work, then he shouldn't eat. eat. Oh man, all right. All right. Well, we shouldn't be like an infidel. We shouldn't be somebody that sits around and doesn't work, and I'll just take a check and we'll take it out of Uncle Sam. That ain't right. That's called communism. That's called socialism, and all that's going to come roosting back. And those that, just like domesticating an animal, if it doesn't know how to feed itself in a time of disaster, it won't know what to do, right? Uh, man, you get out there and work, and you work hard. You young ladies, you work around the house. You do what mom shows you. This is part of our nature. God wants us to work while we're here and be hard workers and work under the Lord. So he says, He will enrich him. So David's like, oh, okay, I can get some extra money. This is good because I have it to provide, right? But then it says, look in verse 25, and will give him his daughter. Ah, a wife? Brother Luke, is a wife a good thing? Amen. amen. The Bible's true. Any other men in here would say a wife is a good thing? Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. So I get, a, I get a wife. I'm going to get some money. I'm going to get a wife out of the deal. All I got to do is kill this giant. And I know God can do it, right? Look what else he says. And make his father's house free in Israel at the end of verse 25. Can you imagine that? Boop, boop, boop. Dad, I paid off the house. You can quit worrying about it. And don't worry. The king said there's no more taxes. Who would like to stop paying property taxes? Amen. That would be true freedom. So these are things that we have to provide for in our life. And there was this big problem that nobody wanted to deal with. And David's like, wait a minute. You're going to give me some money and a wife, and I'll never have to pay taxes again? Show me this, Goliath. Like, let's do it, right? But there's more. There's a better motivation. Look what he says in verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? Taketh away the reproach from Israel. You know what that's talking about? Redeeming his people. David was a picture of a Savior. David says, now wait a minute. There's a big fight out there. And they want to come in and hurt everybody, but I can go out there and stop the fight and protect everybody and redeem my nation and redeem my people? Well, let's go take care of business. Notice David did it for others. He did it for his nation. Oh, I wish we had some Christians that would stand up and redeem America and redeem Florida. It's rare you see a politician stand up and actually say, that's weird. We're not going to teach it in the schools. And uh, there's a man and a woman, and that's it. You know what I mean? Come on, think about it. Uh, abortion is murder, and it should be stopped. And when I see somebody doing that, it's like, well, well, amen. Good for them. We need more people to stand up and teach these things. The Christians have gone in the closet. So David did it for his nation. In the last half of 26, he says, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God. Here's his primary motivation. He says, you don't talk about God like that around me. Amen. I'll, I'll shut your mouth. That's right. I've been on several job sites. I used to travel and build conveyor systems and uh, mezzanine and flooring and robots and stuff like that. And I mean, you're with like millwrights, like guys that they know all these skills. I mean, there's some ugly, foul-mouthed dudes. And every one of them that I've had to work by, I took a stand and I said, stop using that word next to me. Don't say it. And so, and don't cuss God. They would use, you know, and listen, Christians, to say those words, OMG, I think you're blaspheming God. If you stub your toe, OMG, and you're like, well, wait a minute, why would you use God's name in such a way? Could you imagine if I used your name in a very vulgar way whenever I got hurt? You would say, leave me alone. Like, could you, Donald, I'm, I'm going to use you, buddy. All right. Oh, Donald! Man, the Donald, you know, you'd be like, hey, he's up on me, right? <laughs> don't talk, don't use my name like that. How do you think it, your creator feels? In Psalms, we sing these psalm songs. We're going to add them into the music this week. 
We sing unto God, and that's a phrase in the book of Psalms that we sing. Oh my God, I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed. Like we use God's name when we're talking to God. We don't use it in a negative way. And when we see a giant come in, and I'm big and bad, I'm the boss, and I talk how I want, you say, watch your mouth. Don't talk about God like that. I'd rather you cuss me than to cuss God. The world doesn't understand that, but we got to take a stand and have no fear about these giants. David did it for his God. Why, who should defy the armies of the living God? You're going to talk about God like that? You better be careful. You don't know who you're messing with. That's right. Now, very quickly, verse 27, And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done unto the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. So his brother, you're just a kid, and who's watching the sheep? And what do you think you're doing? Like, you, you can't fight this giant. You can't fix this problem. Now, this is what the devil likes to do. He likes to get in your family. And they're going to try to reason with you. And they're going to give you a logical reason why trusting God is not the answer to your problems. Isn't that what happens? Even sometimes when it's saved family members, because their heart has already melted with fear, calling him names, you're not able. Verse 29, And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? Isn't there a good reason to stand up and fight this bully and kill this giant? God's going to kill the giant. I don't have to do a thing. And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. And he sent for him. So Saul hears about it. Verse 32, And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now I want you to understand the power of the Holy Spirit. We have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And you know how he's exercising that right here? He's saying, don't let anybody's heart be afraid. David is an encourager when everybody else is scared to death. Saul and his brothers are being discouragers. Look at verse 33. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. He said, This guy's been killing people since he was a kid, and you're just a kid. Well, now he sounds just like his brother. Now, listen to this. His brother saved. Saul saved. We're going to see both of those men in heaven, Eliab and Saul, but their mouth was being used for the devil. David, you can't kill that giant. Just let it go. That's a problem. We don't, we, nobody can fix that problem. They're still trying to instill fear. And in fact, we're going to see in a minute, they're using the same spirit that Goliath used in the same words. Verse 34, David says, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. David goes on and tells him, I killed a lion with my bare hands, and I killed a bear. Look at verse 36. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. There's his true motivation. You're going to talk about God? God's given me the power to rip apart a lion and to fight a bear empty-handed? This giant is nothing. Now listen to me, Christian. The next time you get that bad news... And you get discouraged. You've got some big problem in your life that it's a giant. Have faith in God. Amen. This is all that David is doing. He's encouraging people. Stop telling me no. God can do it. Stop telling me no. God can do it. Look at verse 37. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. So David's persistence paid off. He kept telling the king, I can do it because God is with me. I can do it because God's on our side. We have nothing to fear. God is with us. And finally the king believes it. He's like, you know what? 
this lad is probably right. He's got the Spirit of the Lord on him. He's not afraid of this giant. God can use him to kill a big old giant. Christians, I want you to have this same spirit. When you get bad news, just simply say, God is in it. It may be a giant. It may look like, I don't know how we're going to fix this now, but I know God has a plan. What was it Job said? Though the Lord slay me, yet will I trust him. What else did he say? I will come forth as gold. We're going to stand before the Lord one day, and how we handle our problems down here is a witness to others around us. And God sometimes gives us problems just so we'll speak up and glorify Him. Don't miss that opportunity of a blessing because we get afraid of the giant. Call it what it is. It's a giant. It's a big old problem. The devil's trying to use it. It may slay me, but you know what? If I have faith in God, then God can get the glory in the whole process. The story goes on, and I'll be brief. It's time for us to go home. But I want you to... It, David was given the armor from Saul. Saul said, put on this armor. He says, I've not proved them. He tried putting it on. And here's the thing. People will try to tell you, we've always done it this way. This is our tradition. We're going to keep doing it this way. And sometimes you just have to stop and say, I, I don't think that's going to work for me. I think we're going to try something new. <laughs> there was an old story a lady's cooking her turkey dinner. And her kid says, Mom, why do you cut the legs off the turkey when you put it in the oven? She says, I, I don't know. We've just always done that. Let's call Mom. So she calls her mom. Mom, why do you cut the legs off your turkey? Well, I, I don't know. I, we've just always done that. Let's call Grandma. So she calls Grandma. And grandma, why do, you cut, why do we cut the legs off our turkey every Thanksgiving? She says, because I have a little 24-inch oven. <laughs> right? Everybody else is doing it because that's how we always did it. We just thought that was part of what our family did. And it's like, no, we're just trying to adjust, you know? Sometimes tradition and the old methods aren't really the best way. Sometimes we need to take a fresh look and say, wait a minute, let's do it by what the Bible says. And there's other things that are allowable, not necessarily wrong, but not mandated by God. Sometimes a fresh look is a good idea. Let's pick up in this story. In verse 41, it says, And the Philistine came on and drew near to David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. So here's the giant with all his weapons, and there was a man in front of the giant holding a shield also. So it's two men coming at David. Like, first you got to get through the guy with the shield, then you got to get through the giant. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. He looked down on him, thought he was worthless. For he was but a youth, and ruddy, and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest unto me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And this was his mistake. This is where, the, this is where we see the power of our giants are nothing compared to God. The greatest god of the Philistines is a rock. It's a devil. And God created the angels. And God created the rocks and the things that people make idols out of. Verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come unto thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. He's literally, David, David is still empty-handed, guys. You realize that. He's empty-handed. We know he has a sling and we know he has some stones in his bag. But David's just standing there, and he's, I mean, I've got my spear, I've got my sword, and there's a guy holding a shield, so you can't shoot an arrow at me. And David's a kid out there, like, are you going to send a kid? I'm going to eat him up for dinner, right? That's what he's saying. But David said, I'm coming in the name of the Lord. Verse 46, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. He has great confidence in God. He's not afraid to proclaim it. And that's what God wants from us. God wants us to have great boldness when it comes to these giants that we have to deal with and say it does 
doesn't matter. God is still on the throne and He will give us victory. I fear nothing except God. And I'm, I'm afraid of God and I'm living for God in the fear of the Lord. Then what do I have to worry about with some giant problem? To God be the glory. This is huge. The illustration here is for you today that God will kill your giants if you come at it in the name of the Lord and you come at it in true faith, not wavering. Uh, I think God can probably might be able to uh, help us out in this. No, no. I, I know God's going to win. And if he wants to use me, boy, praise the Lord, little old me. But it's God that's going to get the victory. It's His name that's going to be elevated. It's going to be a reputation that there is a God in Israel. There is a God in Jacksonville. There is a God over here on Halsema. And people need to know it. That God is still on the throne. Verse 47, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, hey, or bank account, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Guys, this is my final point. When the problem is before you, you approach it quickly. You attack the problem. Don't run from problems. If God gives us problems so that we can mature spiritually, why would we hide from that? Oh no, this looks like it's going to hurt. But you know, wait a minute. God wants to use it to help me to grow. Maybe I can witness to somebody in it and they'll get to go to heaven. What am I afraid of? I need to attack the problem. I need to go head on. I need to go right into the problem. David, the kid, running after a giant. All of his people watching. He's just a kid. What's he going to do? His brothers didn't like him. The king didn't know. The king had already known him and he forgot who he was. He's a nobody. But with God, you're somebody. And there is no giant big enough to get victory over God. Verse 49, he said, well, I want to read 48 again. He says, and it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted, that means he didn't waste any time, and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. It wasn't just the man, it was the whole army. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. It goes on. He cuts off his head. The rest of the army, they get invigorated. They go and fight. And boy, they really do. They, they destroy the Philistines that day. And it all came down to a stone. You know, Jesus is likened unto a stone, isn't He? He's the rock. He's our foundation. He's what we trust in. We're saved by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're built up as lively stones on that spiritual house. And the Lord Jesus Christ, He is your rock. He's your stone in a sense, and that's all that David had with him. If he had confidence in his weapons, he had very little confidence, didn't he? But his confidence was in the name of the Lord that God gets victory over giant problems in our life. And I want you to accept it the next time a problem, maybe you're going through a problem right now, and you didn't raise your hand when I asked if you needed prayer. Maybe you're going through a major problem right now and you're mentally distraught, you're physically wore out, you're financially broke. I don't know what it is, but you know what? God knows. He cares. And He wants to give you the victory. If only you'll give it to Him and trust in Him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just ask that You would help us to realize there's no Goliath greater than You. Lord, I pray that you would use these words out of your word to strengthen the hearts of your people. Lord, I pray that you would help us to go out into this dark world and shine the light and tell them that there's victory in Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would bless the soul winning this weekend. Help us to see somebody saved. Lord God, I ask that you would give us new visitors to church on Sunday. Lord, we're not afraid. We're ready to go to battle with you. Lord, I pray that you would help on Sunday that we would be able to better learn how to preach the gospel without fear. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.